I'm Andrew Patterson from interest.co.nz and welcome to another in our business success series. With me today, Peter Lee, uh, adjunct professor at the University of Auckland and a commercialisation consultant. Peter, welcome. So Peter, we're hearing a lot these days about uh, innovation. Uh, why do you think New Zealand is, is pretty good on, on innovation but much less strong on commercialisation? Well, that's a good point. We have been recognised, and the data says we're good at the front end of innovation. I mean, we're good at getting the basic ideas together to, to create some sense of possibility. But the reduction to practice, um, we are lower on the scale, um, much lower actually, below average. So why is that? Um, I, I think there's several reasons you could think about. One is that we, uh, our talent, that um, bright, innovative um, group, for example, that um, graduate from our universities, um, has a predilection to get some overseas experience. It's not a bad idea. Um, so a lot of that talent um, that would otherwise move into industry and immediately start building those ideas and that capability into real products and real services and value add, goes off seas for a while, hopefully, and then comes back. Um, then the infrastructure itself for ideation, uh, innovation in New Zealand is not well developed. We have some a, a few large industrial companies that have the capability and practice innovation. We have a tranche of uh, small struggling startups that live and die by innovation. But between those two extremes, there is a large group of companies and industries that are not practised at innovation. Um, their scale uh, it makes it difficult to assign scarce resources in a substantial way to sustain innovation. Um, we, we have not uh, got a strong history of the process of innovation. The process is to take those ideas and see them reduced to practice. So we're coming from behind, if you like, in terms of uh, building this. And this is interesting because we think of innovation now much more as a process, whereas if we go back to some of those success stories that New Zealand has had, they've almost in some ways been accidental, haven't they? I think they've been the uh, the work of um, some very energetic individuals. Mm -hmm. But it's, I like the idea that you put across that innovation is a process because it certainly is. It's not the um, act of uh, superhumans, uh, some a special group of people with a special set of powers, um, entrepreneurs with uh, you know the alpha male stereotype. It's absolutely not. Innovation is a process. Some practice it better than others. Mm -hmm. But you can actually go through a stepwise process of taking a glimmer of an idea through to a commercial outcome. And it's that process that uh, we need to understand and practice more substantially in New Zealand. Why are we much more focused on commercialisation now than, say, 20 years ago? We didn't really hear an awful lot about this need to commercialise. Why are we so focused and almost obsessed on it these days? <laughs> well, there's, I think there's a global trend, number one. But why especially in New Zealand? And I think there's a growing awareness of the fact that um, we are very dependent on a few primary industries. And those primary industries... Um, um, have their ups and downs. When I did my overseas experience, in 1975 when I left, there were 20 sheep to every person in New Zealand. I can remember that statistic, but I calculated recently, I think that's down to seven. Mm. So what happened to the wool industry? Well, you can look to synthetic fibres and, and the, the uh, sophistication of that industry to create um, alternatives to natural fibres as having eaten away inexorably and maybe almost unnoticeably in a kind of a, a sudden event of that core industry. And you have to wonder about the sustainability of some of our other industries in, uh, against the attack of alternatives. So we're feeling, I think we're feeling vulnerable and we feel that we need to establish an, an alternative um, uh, economy, not to displace but to come alongside and provide a little bit more um, breadth in terms of our um, economic well-being. 
I mean, we've all noticed recently, um, you know, just how vulnerable the New Zealand dollar and, 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 and our concerns about um, uh, export has been threatened or, or influenced or affected by the, um, the incident of... Um, of um, contamination recently. I mean, it just, it's just a little hiccup, maybe, hopefully, but it just shows that, you know, just a small things in that big dependency is creating um, uh, issues. So I think the government gets it. I think most people get it. Um, and so that's why I, I would think um, quite validly we are somewhat desperately trying to establish these alternatives. And yet I was interested to hear John Key this week say that, you know, New Zealand has a competitive advantage in dairy and, and we're very good at it and we should basically just, just stick to it. Isn't there a risk, though, that, that, that you know, the dairy sector does face the same outcome as the wool sector? Well, look, uh, I absolutely agree with that statement. We need to stick with it. We need to make the most out of it. Most large companies that I've been associated with in overseas have that same philosophy. I mean, I, I worked with the paper industry. You might say that that's a, a twilight industry to some extent too. 80% of our innovation and our research and our market research and our product development was focused on existing products to existing markets. But there's always the 80-20 rule. The 20% we absolutely had to carve out and protect and foster the looking for outside of the existing markets and outside of the existing products for those alternatives, those breakthroughs. So as a national level, I'd absolutely agree that, that we've got to support and grow and enable those core businesses. But we must have the discipline as well to establish uh, an alternative, um, far-reaching, longer-term view of potential economy, economic outcomes from New Zealand. Of course, previously you were chief executive here at the University of Auckland at the um, Uni Services, which is the commercialisation arm of, of the university. Yes. Is that a model? Obviously we've seen it um, spill over into the ice house and, and that sort of incubator idea, but is that an approach that we need to be doing more about? Yes, so I was CEO and um, of Uniservices, and, and I immensely enjoyed it. I mean, we had a great growth, and I think that's not atypical of many such technology transfers. Um, feeding, t taking this um, this innovative capacity that's inside our universities and building it up into a value proposition for industry. So it's it's a good metaphor. Um, now that I'm not CEO, but I've now gone back into the university, my passion is actually to take the raw material, which is our graduates and our young staff, our PhDs, our postdocs, and their hunger, I would say by and large, their hunger to find a valuable outcome for their in-depth knowledge that they've developed and how to take that in-depth knowledge, cause it to have ideas, cause it to network into something bigger than an idea but uh, a value proposition and then how to take that value proposition through this process of commercialization to an outcome so they're actually thinking in that space almost by by default without almost having to be taught it well look we we had um we put on two sessions recently um both completely sold out almost immediately 25 students each so 50 students have just gone through the it was two of the most exciting days um, that I've had recently in terms of um, imparting knowledge to those um, PhD students and about um, how to take their, um, you know, their, their really intrinsic um, basic knowledge that they've developed and, um, and see that turn into something of value. Because the, this is the other aspect of it too, isn't it? That traditionally we've seen certain people having the ability to commercialise, but but what you're arguing through the process is that if you've got the fundamental depth of understanding, the, the commercialisation process just then becomes a natural extension. Yeah, it's not it's not my argument. It's actually a result of research. Um, people have researched entrepreneurism, serial entrepreneurism, not not the lucky one strike. But people have come back time and time again and their characteristics. So once upon a time, not so long ago, we used to think science was something uh, that was done in a royal society in London, you know, with uh, landed gentry, with kind of special capabilities. But then the, the scientific process was discovered, you know, and that it was a series of uh, very well-disciplined step-by-step to generate new knowledge. 
It's the same with entrepreneurism. It is five essential cap um, characteristics uh, or things you do to be entrepreneurial. With that tool set, I mean, some would do it better than others, but everybody has got the capability to run through this process. It's not a refined, small set of special people with special characteristics anymore. Interestingly, the world is, is taking an interest in New Zealand because it seems we are, despite everything that we have perhaps going against us, uh, are overperforming in some of these areas. What, what, what's that research telling us and, and what, what, why are we being noticed? Yeah, we are being noticed. <coughs> and um, so, so one uh, thing recently is that um, the University of Auckland, for example, showed up on an MIT survey of global entrepreneurism. Um, we were rated in one, one of three, I mean, it wasn't, I'm not sure we were one, two or three, they just, but there was a cluster of three um, entrepreneurial communities, if you like, that kind of came out of the uh, crowd. Um, and that crowd was not the Stanfords and the Cambridges, but who, who in the world is doing well in terms of this basic innovative capability um, under adverse conditions? And we had three strikes against us. No news here, I'm sure. We were remote, so we're away from kind of main, mainline, mainline happenings. Um, we're, we don't have a large corporate group, so, and we don't have um, a lot of venture capital. Despite that, we've been able to move the needle and be, be noticed. And uh, so, yeah, people are now, I mean, so we're, MIT is coming down to find out a bit more about that. What, what is it that makes us special which is a reflection too of, of some of this dna thing that we often we often talk about we you know as, as we mentioned at the start there there is this innovation gene somewhere in in, in our metabolism but but it's it's moving it to that to, to that next level do you believe that there are barriers that are holding us back are there specific things that you think we should be working on to to advance this well those three issues um I mean, let's not make excuses. We can get over them. When you think about uh, remoteness, actually, a lot of people who travel realise that actually we are 11 hours, uh, and New Zealand does this well, I can put a plug in, but <laughs> 11 hours from most of the major centres on the Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. So 86% of Uniservice's international business is on the Pacific Rim. I mean, we can get to... Um, Singapore, we can get to Shanghai, we can get to Vancouver and LA and San Francisco. You just get go on the plane, go to sleep, get up, and you're ready to perform because you, time-wise, in terms of your body, you're three or four, four or five hours. You can get up and perform almost straight away. It's very comfortable for us mm -hmm. to do business in that face-to-face mm -hmm. -face business. Of course, you know the internet takes a lot of the noise out of doing business remotely. But just if you need to do the face-to-face, -face, that's not that's not hard to do. Big corporates bit of a struggle. Um, and, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of the, what the government's doing. Um, I think it's the right thing in putting together uh, facilities like the Callaghan Institute to enable more, um, maybe smaller scale industries to enter into this innovative process and to become um, active in that um, area. Um, and then, um, Capital, well, um, there again, the, you know, to, to some extent, the, the government can maybe sweeten the, uh, the attractiveness of uh, early stage investors to this uh, um, type of um, innovative um, new startup um, companies. A couple of couple of specific areas I wanted to talk to you about um, networks, because right. because if if you were to look at America and say it's become very successful at innovation because it's very good at networking, yeah. is is that a correlation? Is that a genuine correlation? It's such an important part of um, building value is to be able to exchange your idea with others and let others build on it. Um, if you do that process, you'll find that actually uh, your idea will morph and change and become bigger. You will bring a community of interested people along. Um, when I left New Zealand quite a long time ago, I went to the US, and I spent 30 years in the US, uh, I, I went into a whole different um, level of networking. And it was difficult. I mean, I think, uh, you know, New Zealanders f from my era, uh, it was hard for us to kind of be <laughs> outgoing uh, it's not i don't know it's kind of the you know solid silent type and um no doesn't make it so i had to make it was an unnatural act and i had to make a special effort but you know what when you do reach out and you have those conversations and you get 
you you um, you experience the feedback and the ability to build an idea and uh, over time, then you say, why haven't I done this before? Why haven't I made a special effort to create a community? And you know, the science says it's not the person you know next door. It's actually the weak links are the strongest links. The links that are f that you kind of haven't talked to for a while, um, dormant linkages, dormant parts of your network, give people a call that you haven't talked to for a while. We have a reluctance, might be rejected. I can't imagine, I can't remember when I was rejected. Normally people say, well, thanks for giving me a call. And I really feel special that you've asked me my opinion about something. And, you know, there's an outpouring. We, it, I, I mean, so networks, yes, we've, I think that's one thing that we can learn to do a lot better. And maybe things like LinkedIn, the technology is actually helping us do it. I mean, you, you've almost got no excuse now, really, isn't it? Because the, you, the database is sitting right there on, on, on your PC or your laptop. LinkedIn and, you know, Kia, another device we have in New Zealand, um, I think it's really good because um, you're not going in quite cold turkey. You have common, commonality already. It's like the Māori, you know, I'm from this mountain with this stream. You know, all of those people in Kia at least have one thing in common. They're from New Zealand. So that, um, you've got that initial connectivity that you can build on. What about intra entrepreneurship? We hear a lot about entrepreneurship, yeah. but, but, but talk to us about the importance of entrepreneurship as, right. as, a, as another part of the innovation process. Okay, so inter entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs inside big companies. And um, so they, um, they have available to them, in principle, a lot more resources than entrepreneurs who are trying to do it by themselves. But they also face some um, extraordinary difficulty in being entrepreneurial in a big company. So it's so important though, it's this 20% of uh, you know, a company's uh, research and development activity that's dedicated to the new, the innovative, the provocative, the game changing. And both, and the company really needs to make a special effort to recognize and nurture these people. You have to have some words related to innovation in your strategy. You have to have metrics by which you can measure and, um, and, and, and uh, enable innovation. And you have to have um, accountability. It's the old, all of those are pretty standard things that companies do to achieve their day-to-day -day activities, which can just as well be applied to the innovative process. If they are, then those people who inherently are innovative have a receptive part of the organization to perform in. It's not something we do ex very well again in New Zealand, but it's a, it is a discipline that's proven and um, does make a difference to the longevity um, and the uh, performance of companies. Related to that, of course, is ideation, the idea, the, the, the process of coming up with ideas. I often think within organisations you've got people who are naturally talented in this area, but I often wonder if, if they spend most of their time kind of knocking the gear, their head against the brick wall trying to actually get their ideas through through the process. So so how, how should companies be and businesses be thinking about ideation and recognising uh, those within the organisation who do have that capacity? It's a big question. And actually, there have been societies, and I belong to an industrial research institute, have spent decades trying to understand how to do this. Um, but uh, it's very frustrating if you're an employee who has a sense of wanting to do something different, to make a big contribution over a longer term, in to innovate, um, to be in a company that doesn't reward that. And, then, and that's because of a loss of opportunity. Um, but it's difficult also for the company from based on pressures from day-to-day -day pressures from shareholders and um, quarterly profits to actually carve out and protect a special um, organization or group of people or, or investments that uh, are not necessarily going to return anything in the near term. In fact, they're kind of risky. So you're not very sure whether you're going to get any return at all. Um, and so um, it's, there really needs to be, uh, from the top down, a commitment to, as part of the strategy, to say, I will, I am going to set aside those resources. I'm going to measure and hold them accountable to a different set of outcomes than I am from my day to day. Mm -hmm. um, 
through economic cycles. It, it's tough, but evidence shows that it pays dividends to a company in a three to five, five year time frame, not a three to five month time frame. Spent some time recently at Google, and that would be at one extreme of the spectrum. That, that whole place is just an ideas factory, and many businesses and companies would look at that and say, I don't, "We don't want to go there. That, that's just, yeah. you know, that's that's too far off beam." But then, equally, they're they're right at the other end of the spectrum where there's there's not a lot happening. So, where do you find the middle ground? Do you think? Yeah. So, okay, I I, I said I worked for you know the paper industry. You can think boring, uh, but it was a big company, and they did set aside and part of my. Um, role there was to to be that nurturing so what do we do i mean we, we did some pretty Im- interesting things that added great value um so there was the the photo photography you know the celluloid photography was going down the tube and there was this new um, means of taking digital photographs people had inkjet printers in their home i don't know if you remember but at one point then inkjet printers could produce photographic quality prints basically with the same old $100, $150 printer, but the paper. So we produced that paper in conjunction with Hewlett-Packard. I bought a little coding facility in McKinney, Texas. We re, 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 did. We made tremendous profit, I mean, which is what everyone wants in business eventually, mm-hmm. and, 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 and actually were leaders in that industry to create that new tranche of papers. It was game-changing for the industry because now people were able to not only take their photographs digitally, but print them and, uh, and display them digitally because we've gone to a whole other era now which is um being able to carry them around on an ipod um then uh oh another one was um and you might think this is a bit mundane but um the the six pack being able to make a um not a wooden crate to carry beer and soft drinks but actually something made out of paper and you made it and that could get wet in a cooler and still hold together well that was applying fracture mechanics to paper we made the six pack that was a big, big deal in the US and maybe globally. Maybe one of the most extreme ones was maybe we made the skin for the stealth bomber. Mm. The radar absorbing skin for the stealth bomber was made in the basement of my research lab. That was the most profitable product of any of the ma- massive paper machines we had anywhere in the world. And so we can go on. So it is possible for companies to create new lines of business new profitable lines of business that you might not have imagined before um, if you allow some part of your company um, not completely to go wild. You have metrics, you have processes, you have accountability, but just to protect them and allow them to go through this process. Part of it's a, a culture too as well, isn't it? it? It's the culture of allowing ideas to flow and that I guess ultimately that does come from, from the top, from the chief executive. It does. It has to be a belief. There has to be um, you know, confidence that you will get these game changes. Finally, Peter, if we, we think of as a country, um, what do we really need to be focusing on, do you think, it, it, it's, it's process? We, we're starting, you know, the, as you say, the momentum is starting to build. Yes. So if we, if we think about culture and capability, where, where, where should the focus be, do you think? Well, there's a lot of places, but I mean, where I am right now, I, I think I'm at one of the pulse points, which is I'm inside a major university in, in New Zealand, and there are graduates here who are graduating with engineering degrees, with business degrees, with uh, biochemical, dis- uh, biological degrees, and they are getting alongside that, because um, I'm enjoying teaching them, a view of how to create value from that inherent skill, that scientific skill they've got. And I'm so um, encouraged to see uh, such a um, eagerness by those um, um, students to absorb this information and, uh, and, and kind of think about how they might be able to put together their intrinsic technical knowledge with um, some skills, uh, some tools of, of how to take that knowledge and create some value. So there is going to be a next generation of... Um, of students coming out of our universities that have that combination of skills. So um, industry in New Zealand, watch out. And New Zealand, watch out, because this is tremendous resource.